everyone. My name is Drew Beider, and I'm the director of the Summer Institute for Human Rights and Genocide Studies here in Buffalo. And I'm here with my colleague, Kate Elchi, from the International Peace and Security uh, Institute. And Kate, thank you for joining us today, along with our prosecutors. And Kate, tell us a little bit more about uh, the organization you represent and our sponsor today. Sure, I'm with the International Peace and Security Institute, IPSI. Uh, we're a nonprofit in DC, Washington, DC, that works on education and training around peace and conflict and international justice issues. Um, we want to give a shout out to the International Bar Association. They've been sponsoring this for since uh, 2012, and they're making this simulcast possible today. And we also, you know, the person who's not in the room, there's several people who are with us in spirit, including our dear friend Clayton Sweeney, who sponsored this several years ago, along with uh, our, our friends from Nuremberg, who uh, were here in the, in the past few years, Bill Kaming and Henry King, among others, who sat with our students and told them literally they're the future of the world. And uh, we honor their spirit with us. But today, it's a time where students, both from a collegiate level and from a high school level, can uh, mingle with the prosecutors and ask questions that uh, maybe you, you felt a, a little bit restrained to earlier in the day. Uh, and our format is that we're going to go from a high school question to a college question. And, you know, uh, for sake of time, we want to squeeze as many questions as we can. So if you could keep your opening statements to under 30 seconds here, we'd appreciate it because that's been a concern in the past. Uh, so our first uh, questionnaire uh, will be uh, J.C. Miller uh, from uh, Springville High School. And uh, if you could introduce yourself when we call upon you and um, we'll piggyback or ping pong back and forth. But J.C., tell us more about your question today. Okay. So um, for those of you who are from the States, we're um, born and raised here no matter where you've ended up now. Um, I'm curious as to know, um, what are your thoughts on our own country's lack of, or I guess our shortcomings, and the fact that we have yet to be uh, really faced any prosecutions of our own uh, against ourselves for any, um, I guess, violations in international law that we've like acted upon, I guess. So, I mean, it doesn't matter. Well, let me just real quickly say that I think that all persons who uh, commit crimes should be held accountable. Uh, in the United States, the Constitution says that uh, the laws come from the people. Uh, the people have not really been fully made aware of what has taken place since 9-11 related to various allegations that have taken place during both the Bush and somewhat the Obama administration. And uh, it's up to the American people to decide what to do about this as opposing to the federal government telling them uh, that it's all is well and that it's time for us to move on in, into the future. I have a slide in my class at Syracuse University College of Law that shows Charles Taylor and the pre a picture of President Obama saying exactly the same thing about forgetting the past and moving on. Uh, we are a, a nation of the rule of law, uh, but we're also a nation that uh, all the power comes from the people. We just don't know what, what has happened related to uh, Guantanamo, Abu Ghraib, uh, Bagram Air Force Base, the electronic eavesdropping program where the United States government uh, has and, and frankly continues to monitor all of the electronic devices of all American citizens across this country. Uh, so if you just look up and wave, they'll, they'll appreciate that. Uh, so no, I'm a big believer and let the American people decide where we should go related to some of these allegations. And I also think that, that today, in, in some respects, we're falling very short of the principles that make this country a great country. Uh, and I think it's happening because leadership wants to protect leadership or they don't want to even make the divisions in this country deeper. There have been some prosecutions for criminal conduct in Afghanistan. Uh, they've been at the lower level. Have they been sufficient? Have the sentences been sufficient? Uh, in my mind, not. Uh, so I think we have a lot of work to do uh, in terms of allowing foreign courts to determine uh, guilt of Americans who are uh, accused of crimes. I think there's a lot more to the United States reluctance than, than a reluctance to uh, hold its citizens accountable. I think there are fears that politics would play too great a role in who would be brought forward. Uh, but my answer to that is very simple. Fine, try them in the United States, but don't let people walk away from accountability. I can just add, I think, I think for me, what, what is more stark is the failure 
by the United States to investigate allegations of torture that came out of the torture report. So nothing to do with international courts. The United States is obliged by its own laws to investigate and prosecute all, 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 all commissions of torture. And President Obama has done nothing about that. And I think that's, 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 that's a matter to me as a, as a friend of the United States that that, that, that isn't being done. Good question. Excellent. We have a question from one of our college students. College student? Yes. Oh, okay. Hello. Uh, my question to the prosecutors is, what is the greatest career challenge that you faced and had to overcome? What? what is the greatest career challenge that you have faced and have had to overcome? Career challenge, it meaning how they got into? No, 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 no. I'm, I'm actually interested more in um, currently in office. Okay. Uh, there, what has been the greatest challenge? Just getting through my exams. <laughs> That's it. Uh, I would just say that perhaps uh, one of the biggest challenges I think that we all face is trying to uh, make these international justice cases, which are so big and complex, uh, work more efficiently. Uh, there's no question when cases like Shashel is very special circumstances, but it's been five years since the evidence stopped and there's no judgment. All the cases, even the ones that I think were done very well and, and, and worked out pretty well, uh, they're taking five years or more often uh, from arrest to even trial judgment, and then a few more years for appeal. So, but it's not simple to deal with those because what's important about doing these cases is do them in a way that um, the defendants enjoy a fair trial and that the results have credibility. So. That is one of the challenges I think we all still face, how to make the system work more efficiently so that there will be more courts in the future. Because if every court is spending $20 million on cases with small results, uh, there's the future of international justice is limited. Nick's kind of shifted the uh, answer away from what I take your question to be, which is kind of a personal one. And I think that's a good thing to do. Um, I think he's right, but uh, to take some comfort from domestic uh, criminal procedures, some of the big complex cases in domestic criminal settings take easily as long as the ones that uh, we do. I remember being involved with a police corruption investigation and I went back to the Rwanda Tribunal. Three and a half years, I came back to my office in Toronto and the trial was just started. That's because there'd been appeals and all sorts of things that happened, but the case itself had taken years to bring to, to an end. So we shouldn't be too discouraged, although I think Nick's right. We need to uh, improve the efficiency with which we work. And uh, our main objective as prosecutors is to make sure that we prosecute these cases effectively, quickly, fairly, and at less cost. Uh, of course, the tribunals have often been criticized on all those calls, but when, when you look at the experience of countries, national judiciaries, we try to take over our cases from the father. If some of them have had more trouble, in fact, than the tribunals themselves, in terms of cost, in terms of the time it has taken them, to the extent that many of these countries have rather that the tribunals did these cases than have them tried at a national jurisdiction. Excellent. Any other challenges that you face professionally um, that anybody would like to add? Well, I think one of the challenges, uh, even, even in the courts that were created by the Security Council, where supposedly every member state of the United Nations had an obligation to comply with requests and orders of the court, with the Sierra Leone court, only Sierra Leone had that obligation. And it was certainly frustrating to know that there was very relevant evidence in countries outside of Sierra Leone that the countries for various political reasons uh, would not comply with requests uh, or orders of the court. And the uh, court is very hesitant to give orders that it can't enforce. And so the, the inability 
uh, for example, at the ICC, the inability to get people that you have indicted. The, that was the inability at the, um, at the ad hoc tribunals. It wasn't that the court was failing in any way. It was that the, the states of the international community uh, were not showing the political will uh, willingness to come forward and do what they should be doing. And so uh, I think a, a lack of political will in the, uh, in the global community is very frustrating for us. And they find a way to turn it around and make it a criticism of the court when, in fact, we don't have the authority. Uh, it's the states that have the authority, and they simply are not acting um, to uh, fulfill their obligations. Excellent. Thank you. Any follow-up uh, to your question? You? Oh, uh, no, I mean, they answered. I was really interested in you know, some of the personal experiences, but of course the prosecutors are so Great. Thank you. Emily, let's go to your question on victims' rights. Um, I, my question is more so ethics-based, but nonetheless. Um, my question is, how moral is it to gather evidence from victims, and how heavily does that weigh? And also, how do you set your sympathy and sentiments aside when presenting to the court? Hmm. That's a good question. Yeah. We had, in those 22 years, uh, of existence of our tribunal for the former Yugoslavia. We had more than 4,000 witnesses coming forward to testify, a large part of them victims. And reactions were very, very different, you know, for some victims, victims. I mean, for all it was difficult to testify. For some, it was really going through a very, very difficult moment in exercise. And for others, it was really, as they told us afterwards, the most important moment of their life because they could tell their story. And uh, I think I can speak for, for all uh, my colleagues. Uh, in fact, all those meetings and discussions we have with victims and victims organizations, they really give, give us the, the strength to, to do the job we are doing. Because very often I'm getting this question, what is, doing, what is it doing to a human being to deal during 20 years with the dark side of humanity? Because we see every day in the courtroom people who have committed crimes which are totally unimaginable. Uh, well, the, we are much more impressed by victims we are meeting, and they are the only heroes in the conflict because they survived, they were, were uh, willing to testify. Uh, so, so they are really very much uh, partners for prosecutors. As far as I'm concerned, I'm meeting with them every second month with the main victims organizations from Bosnia, in particular the organization Mothers of Srebrenica, which are the female survivors of the, the genocide, which was discussed earlier. Now, at our tribunal, it's a different with the, with the ICC, difference with the ICC, there's no victim's participation or, or uh, w within the proceedings. But based on judgment which are coming out at our tribunal, uh, victims can launch uh, proceedings at the national level. But it's really um, uh, key for us to, to interact with, um, with, with victims uh, uh, because, as I said, uh, we, without them, without their testimonies, none of our tribunals could have achieved the results we, we were able to achieve. You know, it's interesting uh, uh, what I would say to my office, and uh, Britt and I worked together for the first year together very intensely uh, building a case against most of these individuals is we had to remind ourselves that this is for and about the victims. And when you get focused on a case and you're working every day, you tend to kind of put that aside because there's technical things that you have to do. But one of the important things that the outreach program that we started was as we went out to the victims, we saw the victims every day, and it reminded us that, that this is for them. And we would tell them this is, we would tell them that this is for them. I'll just give you a vignette to show you the power of of victims being allowed to come in and tell their story, because really, that's what they want to do. I remember in, in outreach sessions where I had a gentleman come up, he was missing his left arm and his right leg, and they kind of propped him up, and he, he said, I want to tell you what they did to me. This was after an outreach section, and he told me what they did, and that was to make sure that he lived, lived off balance for the rest of his life. You know, and, and you, you tend to miss that horror that, that, of that one single uh, individual. Another vignette, and I will stop, is 
we had one individual who came in who, who described the massacre at Penduma, and he's the individual that had his hand had his uh, wife raped in front of him while his children counted off each time. His children were killed, and then they cut off his right hand, I believe, and uh, told him to take his hand uh, back to President Kabah uh, in, in Freetown. And he testified about that. And uh, with his, and sitting in the courtroom were some of these individuals who were the heads of these organizations. And he looked at them and he pointed his stump at them and said, you did this to me. Now, what happened was is the individuals dropped their heads out of embarrassment. But when he got up to leave the courtroom, his head was held high, and in some small way, his family had a life. They, they, they became part of the world again because he was able to tell the world what happened uh, to his family. And he walked out uh, right past them uh, with his chin up, saying that in some ways my family didn't disappear. And in terms of the ethics of what we do, I think it's important that all of you know that uh, we do never, never force a victim to speak with us or to testify. And I think one of the things uh, that perhaps is the most serious of what happens to these individuals is that they lose control over their lives, their bodies, and their abilities to make decisions. So they decide they want to speak with us, and they decide they want to testify. Um, and so I have no problems with the ethics of it. Uh, we, uh, as, as Sarah said, uh, there are different reactions, but I, my involvement with witnesses and victims has not been through groups. It's been with them individually. Uh, as a legal officer with investigative teams for a year of my first year and a half at the Yugoslav Tribunal, I was in the field speaking with people who perhaps for the first time had told their stories in detail. So I have a, a real, uh, in my mind, uh, the victims and these witnesses, these survivors, they are the reason that we exist, and the ethics of dealing with them is how you treat them. And you have to treat them as human beings who are deserving of respect and deserving of the right to make their own decisions about what they need, what they will do, and what they won't do. Uh, and I think that in these tribunals, we have, for the most part, carried that, wow. carried that forward. In terms of how do you deal with, with the very human side of it, you cannot help but, but feel uh, as a human being, uh, you cannot help but react to what has happened to them and to their emotional and mental state and physical state. But a part of you has to be separate and apart, and the entire time that you are speaking with them, uh, you are seeing them as a human being, you're interacting with them as a human being, but you're also assessing them in terms of, uh, was this person able to see, hear, or do what they say? Is their story internally inconsistent uh, or inconsistent? Is it consistent with what else I know? So in a way, you almost have to take a schizophrenic approach to them, uh, but you have to do that uh, as a prosecutor. Uh, so I, I think the ethics of it uh, come back to uh, how you treat them, the respect you give them, and in the courtroom, the respect you insist that is given to them during the proceedings. They can be asked hard questions, but they should never, ever be asked disrespectful questions or treated with disrespect. And as prosecutors, you need to ensure that that doesn't happen. Can I, can I just add one, one different nuance that I think is important and a good question? I think in the beginning, certainly, and probably still today, we have to unlearn our experiences from national situations. I was often asked with the attitude of rape survivors. The rape survivors want to testify. And the, the, the answer misses the, 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 the really the substance is that, that in, in, in certainly in the former Yugoslavia, women were, were raped as part of ethnic cleansing. They weren't only raped, they saw their mosques being destroyed. They saw their menfolk being separated and they knew they were being taken off to be tortured and, and, and probably murdered. So they, they wanted to give evidence about their, about, about the atrocities committed against them and their families and their people. And one of the incidents was that they were raped. It was part of the story. They didn't say there was no, uh, it, 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 it's, so the question about whether, whether rape survivors want to give evidence is, is, is very much a, 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 an incorrect imposition on, on, on a different situation. 
Ellen, thank you. You got a lot of response from that. Good job. Hi, I'm Marla Brooks. I'm a law student at Washington University of St. Louis. I was hoping that you guys could answer for me. A lot of the dialogues have spoken to the successes and failures of the various checking models and personal experiences you guys have had. Given your experiences firsthand, what modifications or advice would you recommend to future tribunals that will be created? There are many lessons to learn from, from the work that has gone on. Yeah. And as I think the, the message today was that the lessons come from successes and also from failures. There are many such, and, and I think all our tribunals have been busy in the past year or so trying to document those lessons. Can you speak to some specific things that you think would be successful in the future? For instance, uh, there, there are various areas when it comes to prosecution of sexual violence. We've all realized the need for expediting and giving a sort of uh, uh, priority to it. Because the longer you delay the investigation and prosecution of sexual violence, the more difficult it became to, to, do, to do any work in that particular area. Because you find the, very, the victims want to close the chapter. A decade after the incident, you don't want to reopen those chapters again. And so it became more difficult. So one of the lessons we learned is that you, you need to prioritize that right, right from the beginning. And you need to train your investigators. Make sure you have the right investigators, the right gender, people who know also the culture of the, of the particular area you're dealing with. Uh, we've looked at other areas of our operations, for instance, in the tracking and arrest of fugitives, in court management, the management of witnesses. And witnesses are absolutely crucial to the, to the whole process. They are your building blocks. You need to protect them. If you don't protect your witnesses because of the kind of cases you are dealing with, the kind of people you are prosecuting, the high level of people, they will get at your witnesses and influence them, bribe them, intimidate them, etc. And you lose the evidence. You need to find ways, for instance, of preserving your evidence also, particularly in situations where the people you are trying to prosecute remain at large. Particularly in the case of Rosas and Rwanda Tribunal, we have nine people at large. And the longer they stay out there without being arrested, your evidence, which is largely uh, witness based and not documentary, deteriorates. Your witnesses die, they disappear, they, they, they decide not to give evidence anymore. So, in the event of arrest of any of these fugitives, fugitives maybe five years down the line, you may well end up with a situation where you don't have any witnesses. You then need to find ways of making sure you preserve your evidence. There are many, many, many lessons. I, I would um, recommend that you look at the compendium of lessons, lessons in investigation and prosecution of international crimes, which was jointly published by the ICTR and ICTY, the Special Court of in Cambodia. We've done a manual on lessons learned in the investigation and prosecution of sexual violence in tracking, etc. Uh, the, we've, we've done that with the hope that future generations of prosecutors, uh, both at the national and international level, will be able to learn from our mistakes and not be the same ones again. I think something that all of us would wish for, it's a matter though of states being willing to give us this power and compromise our own sovereignty, is that any future tribunals that are created are created with uh, giving the tribunals enough power to act independently and force cooperation from states. This follows up on the point Brenda Hollis made. But it's very important that the court be able to uh, operate without political influence and have the power to enforce its decisions. It's amazing that in the Rome Statute there actually was a debate. James Stewart mentioned this earlier. Only a recent decision, which I guess is still subject to appeal, that said the uh, tribunal has the power to subpoena witnesses from state parties, or at least make them testify in their own country. Uh, you know, uh, how do you create a court where a court doesn't have the power to, to compel witnesses to testify? So it's very important. I have to add something. Your question was what advice to give to future tribunals. Mm -hmm. uh, and of course, the first advice is to make sure that the one we have are, are supported and are functioning. And uh, of course, the ICC being the only a permanent tribunal, it is very important that there is necessary support, that there are more countries ratifying the Rome Statute 
and that there is uh, more willingness to cooperate with the tribunal. Uh, but we've also learned that the ICC will probably never ever be able to deal with all specific situations. We have seen recently the creation of the, um, two weeks ago, the creation of the Tribunal for Kosovo, uh, Tribunal for Central African Republic. There's a discussion on going to create a tribunal for South Sudan. And the lesson learned for all those ad hoc solutions is that there is not one fit all solution. You have to look into tailor-made <coughs> solution, taking into consideration the legal framework of the region in which you are functioning. Uh, with that the principle, the closer justice is delivered to the communities affected, victims' communities and perpetrators' communities, the better it is. If you have ownership of local communities uh, towards the process, it's much more likely that decisions will be accepted than, uh, than otherwise. One of the problems we have uh, for the tribunal for Yugoslavia that decisions which are taken in The Hague by international judges based on a case presented by international prosecutors, it's easy for people in Serbia or Croatia or Bosnia to, to distance themselves from those decisions because it's a different legal framework, it's a different language, and it's a diff different continent. So for me, one of the very important lessons learned is really try to go as to go as close as possible to the communities affected if it allows an impartial and independent trial. Uh, if not, of course, you, you have to go for the more remote solutions. The International Criminal Court is the only permanent court, and so we really are the beneficiaries, I think, of uh, the experiences of the, of the so-called ad hoc uh, tribunals, and I can tell you that we are extremely interested in those experiences, and I think we are learning a great deal from uh, the experiences of the ad hoc uh, tribunals in many different ways, uh, studying the manuals, uh, receiving the sort of information that Hassan has spoken about, but also absorbing uh, people from those tribunals into the International Criminal Court who come to us with that experience. And I think uh, learning a, a good deal of humility <laughs> because uh, we need to uh, benefit from uh, the experience of, of the ad hoc tribunals. We, I, I won't get into all of the differences between the ICC and the ad hoc tribunals, but they do tend to create a different dynamic, and one of them, uh, Serge has touched upon, we are a court of last resort, not a court of first resort, as the ad hoc tribunals are, and that changes the dynamic uh, very significantly. And so we do encourage um, the sort of uh, local or regional response that uh, Serge is talking about. We, call, we, we speak about it in terms of complementarity. And uh, in some of the situations where we have what are called preliminary uh, examinations open, they've been open for years because we are working with uh, national authorities, local authorities, to encourage the national response that is supposed to occur under the Rome Statute. And it's only where you, you cannot get uh, an independent, impartial uh, delivery of, of uh, international criminal justice at the local level that we have to intervene, and we do uh, intervene. But we can only take uh, a certain number of cases, and one of the issues that we are going to be trying to address over the next few years is the so-called impunity gap. How can we work with other partners to fill that impunity gap? Because we may be able to catch uh, some of the top people and prosecute them, uh, perhaps people who are too powerful within their own countries uh, to be susceptible or uh, subject to justice locally, but there are many people beneath them who have committed atrocious crimes, and Often, they're the ones that the people see walking around in the street, and it's important that they too be brought to justice. So this is one of the challenges, uh, not only for the International Criminal Court as a kind of stimulus to uh, international criminal justice, but to the International Criminal Justice Project itself. Thank you. Let's go to Melissa, one of our teacher fellows here. And Melissa, you're working on, uh, with Wendy, a project uh, we, that will connect teachers and classrooms to the lessons of Nuremberg, but also the lessons of, of the tribunals. Uh, what's your question today that uh, relates to your project and your work here at the center? Um, my question is, do you believe that international justice was successful in dealing with all the crimes against humanity in Sierra Leone? And also, do you believe there will be a time when um, international justice will deal with the crimes Well, in relation to, to Sierra Leone, we had, I think, the proper guidance. It goes back to what Jim said. We had the 
proper guidance that we should focus on those who bore greatest responsibility. So did we in our court bring to justice uh, lower level perpetrators uh, who could not be said to, be, uh, to bear greatest responsibility? No, we did not. Uh, we, were, we were given the guidance that we should focus only on those who bore greatest responsibility, and quite candidly, we never would have had the resources uh, or the time to deal with the others. So uh, I, I think it goes back to, to what Jim said. Perhaps the greatest challenge for states emerging from these horrific situations and the international community is how do we effectively deal with those thousands, tens of thousands of perpetrators who would never go to an international court. One of the ways that you can deal with them is to be sure that no peace agreement has blanket immunity because Sierra Leone could not have dealt with them nationally if they wanted to because they were basically forced to include a blanket immunity clause in the peace agreement that was reached in 1999. So let's do away with that. Human beings need accountability for the wrongs done to them. But that accountability can come in many different forms depending on the level of criminal involvement uh, and the circumstances of the accused. So, for example, in R Rwanda, you had traditional courts dealing with certain levels of criminality. You had national courts dealing with other levels, and then you had the international court dealing with others. You can have truth and reconciliation commissions that are part of this response to wrongdoing, this response to enforcing accountability. So did we in Sierra Leone uh, deal with all the crimes against humanity? No. Virtually the whole country was either a direct or indirect victim uh, of these crimes, and no court can deal with that. You have to be representative in your charges. I think we were representative of all those crimes, but uh, it was uh, impossible for us, and I think for any court, even a national court, um, to deal with all of the crimes that were committed. Uh, Darfur, I'll let, I'll let others speak to that. Let me, uh, let me just speak a little bit about the uh, importance of the crimes against humanity uh, as an international crime and the other inhumane acts section of all of our statutes, which turns this particular international crime into almost a force of law because you can use it to shape and mold uh, whatever you need to do in order to address a horror that, in fact, was not actually contemplated. Or as you move along, you realize that the facts are moving you into a situation where in your statute that lays out the types of crimes that we can prosecute, it really doesn't speak to the gravamen of the offense. And the example that I'll call to you is uh, uh, we had bushwives, uh, tens of thousands of women and girls who were treated like cattle in the bush. Uh, we had in our statute the right to prosecute for sexual slavery and for rape, for terrorism, and, and certain other things, enslavement. But as we began to move along, and we'd already indicted most of the individuals, but as the facts began to flush out, uh, we weren't really addressing the bush wife phenomena in its specific gravamen type situation. So we created a uh, other inhumane act called forced marriage in times of armed conflict. And we amended all of our indictments, which of course raised a lot of dust by the uh, defense counsel. They started to hoot and holler uh, saying unfair, and that was litigated. Uh, and uh, it was found that that was a proper charge, and we moved forward, and uh, uh, the appellate chamber upheld uh, the charge itself, so we were successful, but it, it goes to the fact that crimes, you know, but for crimes against humanity, uh, there would be a huge inability for all of us to charge appropriately. You know, war crimes take place during times of armed conflict, both internal as well as international. Genocide is a specific intent crime and very difficult to prove as you began to realize that today as we talked about the important work that the ICTY was doing. So what happens in between? And the concept of uh, uh, crimes against humanity, you don't need a conflict. It's just a widespread and or systematic attack on civilians, which allows all of us to uh, capture in whatever way we need to do this, uh, the crimes that have been perpetrated in a particular region. You asked about Darfur, and I think, um, as I may have said in other settings, for us it's a long game, and we have all the patience that you need to have. We are a permanent court, we're here, and we will wait 
do what we can to uh, force the hand of the international community. And one of these days, I hope, <laughs> we will get our man. In fact, uh, a few of them. But I have to say that um, there is more work for us to do in the International Criminal Court than we have means at the moment to do. And so when you run into the kind of situation we have in Darfur, uh, you have to shift your resources to the active cases where you're able to, to you know, be active in the field and bring prosecutions and all the rest of it. That doesn't mean we forget Darfur. It doesn't mean that there isn't activity. Uh, it's very much below uh, the radar, uh, notwithstanding what the prosecutor said uh, very directly to the Security Council uh, last December, which was, without the support from the Security Council, uh, I'm putting this case into hibernation, which really means you're maintaining the case. But, uh, of course, if the investigative leads uh, occur, you, you follow up on them. It just means that you're not putting the resources into that particular investigation to the level that you would like to, simply because we, have, we can't afford to do that if there's so much else to do and nothing's happening on, on, that, on that front. But we do uh, pursue, <laughs> notionally, uh, President al-Bashir all over the world where he goes, and he doesn't really have an easy time of it. I mean, the South African situation was the most unfortunate one, but the, 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 he, he exited it in, in quite a, a shameful way, in, in, in a sense, he, with his tail between his legs. He didn't, he didn't leave South Africa in the, in the way he had arrived. Uh, because he, as I say, he left as a, as a fugitive. Um, when he wanted to come and address the General Assembly, Samantha Power, for example, made such a, a noise and so many other things were going on that he stayed away. Um, I think recently he was supposed to be, was rumored to be going to Indonesia, but then Indonesia withdrew uh, the, the invitation. I have been reading in the press that he's either going to China or he's in China. I mean, China is, is a Security Council permanent member. I think it would be shocking if, if, in fact, he was received there. It's interesting because the UN officials uh, do not deal with him because he is uh, a fugitive with an arrest warrant outstanding for him. Very different, for example, from someone who is before the court on a summons. But if they have to, because he is the head of state in Sudan and there are regional issues that they've got to deal with, then they, they make a note of it. It's, it's, it's reported to us and the explanation for it is given because uh, the, the, the rules of, of non-contact, non-engagement with people who are wanted by the ICC and who are on uh, arrest, uh, fugitives from justice with outstanding arrest warrants. But it is, it is really the, the political swim in which we are. We have to behave as a, as a, as a prosecution office in a judicial institution and uh, really, in the end, we depend upon states' parties and, in the case of Darfur, UN uh, um, member states uh, to do what they should be doing. And uh, all we can be is patient. Okay, any other comments to the situation in Darfur, or we'll take another question? question. Um, was there any pivotal moment where you realized that you wanted to be an international prosecutor for like the rest of your life. <laughs> yes, Judge Goldstone said. <laughs> Thank God for those Canadians in Rwanda. And I said, who the hell are those Canadians in Rwanda doing that amazing work? So yeah. that's well, why I spoke it, to it, a little bit. It's a thing in my mind. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, really at the bottom, bottom of the things I wanted to do, but, uh, but the, the politics at the time in 1994 um, sent sent the, 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 the United Nations Secretary General looking to South Africa because Nelson Mandela had just become our first democratically elected president. And they, they had trouble finding agreement on the Security Council on other prosecutors. And they thought that if they got somebody from South Africa that Nelson Mandela approved of, uh, everybody would accept that. And that's what happened. So, so I, I, I was pushed into it not because I had any abilities or wanted to be a prosecutor, but because I was electable. <laughs> yeah. you, know, you know, the fact is that when none of us was studying, uh, international criminal law was not a topic, and none of the tribunals existed. So nobody could have imagined when we were young prosecutors that we would end up at a certain moment at the international tribunal. And as far as I'm concerned, for example, I, uh, I'm from Belgium, and we have in Belgium the Universal jurisdiction, um, at different, at different, at different, in different ways. So we had already in Belgium a few cases uh, related to the Rwanda genocide. And when the International Criminal Court uh, was was created, 
we were encouraged to, to apply to the ICC because we were one of those few countries which had already conducted international cases at, at the national level. But uh, I presume that for the majority of us, it is uh, at a certain moment that it, this opportunity is just uh, presented much more than deciding as a young lawyer, well, I want to become an international prosecutor. Having said that, we have currently uh, have uh, more or less 80 interns a year, uh, young law students coming to the tribunal, and 90% uh, of them want to become international uh, uh, lawyers, uh, so the ICC will never have any problems in, in finding candidates for posts, uh, because nowadays, of course, it's, uh, um, you know, you are already at, at you are ex exposed to the challenges of international criminal justice, and of course, it, it is from a professional perspective, much more interesting and challenging than, than to deal with, with local, uh, small, uh, low-level uh, organized crime cases. It's much more interesting also from a professional perspective. But um, for, get that like for, like for, for Richard, it's, you know, it just happened like that. We, we've been joking about this uh, over the past, uh, over past day. We all looked at each other uh, some, uh, last night and this morning saying, uh, how did you become, how did you know? And, and we, we call it the phone call. Yes. Uh, and we're all busy doing completely different things, uh, and each one of us have different, you know, have a different experience. But at the end of the day, it's always that one phone call that you least expect, asking you to do something that you never imagined that you would do, because we were all doing other things and uh, uh, and working hard at that. I'll just leave you with this though: is that. I wouldn't ask, I wouldn't suggest that you strive to be a chief prosecutor of a tribunal. It's just be very good at what you do. And your reputation will carry you in a direction that you'll have no idea where you're going. And you'll be amazed where you'll be 30 years from now. Uh, but just saw the wood in front of you. Uh, there's nothing wrong with having aspirations and stuff. But you'll be amazed how your reputation at working hard at what you're doing will then start opening doors into the future that uh, you can't even imagine. Can, can, can I tell one story that, that David brings <coughs> to mind? In, in 2004, I was teaching uh, <coughs> at, at New York University Law School, and one of my LNN students was an Austrian girl, Gabriella Lefenau was her name, is her name. And uh, she, she, she was doing an LNN. She, 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 she raised a loan from her <coughs> village in, uh, in uh, about 80 miles from, from Vienna. And she and two other students, LLM students, wanted to work for an international organization, War Crimes Tribunal, Human Rights, and they asked me for a recommendation. And I gave all three of them the same answer. I said, you know, I'm not the person to give you a reference. All I can say is, and you're in my class. You must get people who know you, know your personality, or getting on with people. I said, I, I, I don't know you well enough. Two of them thanked me, all, all three of them thanked me for my advice and said they would follow it. But Gabriella went a step further. She said, surely you need some research done. I'd love to do some research for you, and that way you'll get to know me and you'll give me a reference. <laughs> well, I couldn't refuse. <laughs> Gabriella did good research for me, and as it happened, I didn't know it would happen. I was then appointed to, uh, to, to, to join Paul Welker in investigating Iraq oil for food. <coughs> And uh, I got our office manager to interview Gabriella, and she got a job as one of our investigators. She did extremely well. She got outstanding references from, from Paul Volker and, and from me, and that landed her with a top job in the World Bank. And she's now still working for the World Bank. But had she not added, surely you have some research, and that way you'll get to know me, she, she, she wouldn't have got that. She paid off her bank loan in a year. She thought it would take her the rest of her life. But I, I, I like the story because it's just, just that extra, that extra sentence changed her life. I, I wasn't a prosecutor when I was approached, although I had done a lot of prosecution before I was a judge. When that phone call came, as it came to all of us, I think. Uh, but one thing I always rem remember is advice from an old man in my village. He said, you can plan, but the most important thing is to always focus on apl and apply your mind to the task at hand. Make sure you do it extremely well. The rest depends on that. Mm -hmm. right? Make sure you focus on the task that is at hand. Discharge it as best as you can. 
it is the goal to be in the future. Serge, last year you spoke very eloquently about the importance of learning foreign languages. And I was wondering if you could do a reprise of that answer because it was very compelling at the time. And why is foreign language study a given and so important to international work? Uh, well, I'm coming from a, from a small country which has a, a lot of borders, you know. And if my, my first job as a lawyer and as a prosecutor was at an area where we had a border with, with Germany, with Luxembourg, with the Netherlands, and I'm myself from Belgium, which means that in, in my family everybody has a German-French education, but we also speak Dutch, so everybody speaks the three national languages. And as far as I'm concerned, uh, it has helped me very much uh, internationally. And I've seen also at the national tribunals that uh, uh, having the capability of, of speaking in several languages is, is, is of course a big advantage. Uh, of course, for, for the, especially for the non-native English speaking, it's important uh, to have something in addition to, 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 to English because, of course, the frustration we have sometimes is to, if we are competing with the native, native English speaking, uh, it's, it's, it's not every day uh, uh, easy. But if you then add a number of additional languages, it, it's becoming, again, uh, much more comfortable. And the point I want to make is that, for me personally, it's not only a question of uh, finding more easily jobs if you speak several languages. It's also the interaction with people. Uh, I made the experience myself, you know, I have 400 people in my team. Uh, I can at least communicate in four or five languages with, uh, with, with many of them. And it makes interaction much, much more easier with your own people, with your own staff, but also if you have to deal at the international level with other governments. Uh, for example, in the former Yugoslavia, of course, I, I don't speak Serbo-Croatian language. But with the majority of ministers and presidents I'm meeting there, they all speak a second language or French, English or German. Uh, so I always find a, a language to communicate and it makes a difficult <coughs> discussion so much easier if you have a, a, a common uh, language to communicate. That's why I'm uh, encouraging uh, always all my, my interns and my students in Belgium to really, really look at least into studying seriously a second language if possible, a third one, because it really will increase your chances at, uh, on the international market. I've heard Serge move from Dutch to German to French to English in a single space <coughs> of a few minutes. It's, uh, it's a remarkable gift uh, that he has. But can I just add to what he's saying? I don't think I would have been able to get into the work that I'm doing now if I wasn't fluent in French. It's the second, it's the other official language of my country. I speak both English and French. I work in both English and French. And it's opened every door I've ever walked through. Nick, is there something looking back um, at your high school and collegiate career that you wish somebody would have told you now? Uh, what, what is that old phrase? I wish I would have known then or now. Then, know then what I know now. Is there some uh, word of advice that you'd like to give them to be a, a person of influence? Well, I do remember thinking in high school that language was irrelevant. Why do I have to study a language? Uh, and I really regret that. But uh, what I've found is that um, many people that get into the international field have lived or worked some time abroad. And I think this goes to what Justice Goldstone said. Most of the people to, to get in that door, that first door, it often requires these days uh, to volunteer for something. I know that that tends to unfortunately like United Nations internships those who really come from poor countries have a very difficult time doing it because you have to support yourself with no income but uh, you know I've taken a 50% pay cut to go work in the international field or go work in a case they found particularly interesting a couple of times and uh, if, if you really have an interest in working in a particular type of field then sometimes you have to make that sacrifice and hopefully it will pay off in the long term because you'll be doing what you like and if you do what you like, you're usually better at it than doing something you're, you're not interested in. Well put. It's a real fertile question here and I, I really like it because I know uh, many of the students approach me privately and you're role models to all of us, you're role models to each other and, and how do they get further on that path? And uh, as someone noted, not everybody can be a prosecutor, but any other comments on that and, and things that you recommend? Would you if like I could add, I'm not a prosecutor, I'm representing the ASTS.
prosecutor who couldn't be here today. And so I, I haven't made that decision, I guess, to be a prosecutor. And a little bit of my background, I worked before joining the STLOTP, I worked uh, with the judges at the Rwanda Tribunal for years. And I think that they're both very rewarding experiences and there's a lot of different avenues to get into work that is directly in the international justice field, like working for the judges or the defense or, or the prosecution. Uh, but there's also work that's related. Uh, I have friends from graduate programs that work in international human rights and in sort of all kinds of training uh, of best practices in that and they, they have I think uh, what Nick was saying about working internationally is very important to that, and what Serge was saying about languages is very important to that. Um, but, but taking that step, if you want to be in the international field, uh, to try to work abroad, try to learn those languages, but, but not, not just focus necessarily on prosecution. Um, keep an open mind, there's a lot of ways to, to contribute to human rights and international justice. And kind of an interesting way to, to do this is, is that I even advise law students, because there's no jobs in law school right now, or very few, and it's a real challenge, but many of them want to go and be a part of an international organization. And Americans don't travel a lot. So what I've advised, and several students have taken it, is they've joined the Peace Corps. It gets them out, it gets them into the field, it gets their hands dirty, and they learn a lot, another language, which kind of kills several birds with one stone. They've come back with their law degrees, or master's degrees, or bachelor's degrees, and now all of a sudden, uh, they were a proven asset to a human rights organization, to a, a tribunal or what have you, because they can show that they've had that, that experience. So there, I'll just echo, there are many ways that you can come at this if you want to be at the international level. But the key is, is to get out there in whatever way you think that is a smart way to do it. And there are all kinds of programs within colleges and you know, even going studying abroad is a beginning of a beginning for you. Uh, uh, as well as uh, once you graduate from college, is potentially look for places that allow you to, to get out there as well and get your hands dirty. The key is uh, get your hands dirty. Be down at the level where you're getting to interact with other peoples of the world. Because uh, when we're looking at you as a resume, <coughs> we're looking at can this person be in a very distressed place and, uh, and live and work. Uh, without wanting to call home or leave in the middle of your assignment because you're lonely or you don't like it. Uh, so these kind of little small things, steps, builds a resume. It builds a resume further uh, and, and, and gets you doing the things that potentially that's what you want to do. I, I think it's also important that you remain flexible because what you're interested in today mm -hmm. may not be what you're interested in in five years or six years. And so you have to be willing to seize the opportunities that come to you uh, and be aware that your, your interests may change. And, and what is the saying that life is what happens when you're planning for it? Um, what I found that my interests changed over the years. I was very fortunate to be in the right place at the right time to be offered opportunities that I took uh, and benefited greatly from it. So, so I think being open about that, to the extent your personal situation allows, being open to seizing those opportunities, even if they lead you in another direction. Thank you all for that very relevant and excellent advice. Can we take another question? We have a question from a law student over there, speaking of which, Jane? Um, yeah. um, I had a question of what has been the biggest uh, hurdle when you've been uh, carrying out these Happy to, to, to start. Um, um, I think the arrest of the fugitives has been for all different tribunals the most most difficult. You know, it took 18 years for the tribunal for the former Yugoslavia to have the last fugitives arrested. Um, those persons who were, you know, in the 90s in power, there was then no political will to have them arrested, and now, uh, you know, finally only in 2008 and 2011, the last fugitives were arrested, which means that, you know, this, this say justice, delayed justice denied, has to be seen differently in the international context, because somebody who is in power today and a little bit untouchable can be in a very different situation a few years later, is what the, the colleague from, from the ICC said, said earlier. Um, colleague Hindastia has mentioned it uh, as well, nine fugitives at large, the ICC, ICC how many, eight? 
I mean, the fugitives do you have? At least that. At least that. Yeah, at least, at least that. Uh, uh, so, so to uh, convince the international community to fulfill that duty, to help international tribunals to get fugitives arrested, that's what I personally experienced as, as one of the most uh, difficult challenges. One of the, the, the challenges, really challenges, you face as an international prosecutor arises from the recognition that your court cannot prosecute all the perpetrators. You can only select a few. And so your process of selection becomes the first challenge you face. How many and who are you going to prosecute? And on the basis of what criteria? And so you have to develop some objective criteria in a transparent way and then select the targets that you're going to prosecute. It's a very, it's a difficult task, and all the tribunals get criticized one way or the other about the selection of our, of, of our targets. Or oh, you've left out this group, you've left out this particular site, you know, and so on. We never escape criticism. It's a very difficult, difficult task, but one which has to be done, because you can't prosecute everybody. You must select a few that you focus on. I think the biggest challenge, certainly in the beginning of the life of the ICTY and the ICTO, is to overcome the bureaucratic inertia and, 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 and getting, getting the UN to fund these organisations. Because they were, they were set up by politicians who, who, for whatever reason, thought this was a good idea. But they didn't think about funding it, setting it up, how much it would cost, uh, how it would fit in, how this new bureaucratic, how this new animal, the, the RCTY or the RCTR, would fit into the UN system. And uh, I think there's similar problems with the, potentially with the ICC. If, if, if the ICC doesn't continue to be funded by, by the members of the Assembly of States Party, there could be problems. The financial problems have arisen. The, the Assembly of States parties want a, want a zero budget, zero increase. So they're very nitty gritty practical problems that, that face people who are leading, leading these tribunals. You know, it's interesting. It's the only job I ever had that I did what I was asked to do, and, and they got mad at me for doing it. Uh, and I think all my colleagues can understand the nuances of that far more than you could. But it is a fascinating human circumstance. You are asked by the Security Council to prosecute those who bear the greatest responsibility for war crimes and crimes against humanity in Sierra Leone. You go do that, and you go back to New York to report on that, and you're chastised for, uh, for doing the job that you were asked to do. I know that sounds absolutely absurd, but that's true. And you go back to your office or wherever that may be and scratch your head and going, wow, what just happened here? I thought I was doing rather well, but all the you folks at the UN are, are furious at you because you indicted Charles Taylor. You know, there's a, I'm still at the US State Department, there's a picture of me at the West African Division where there's darts that are still on the wall. Uh, uh, I'm persona non grata in, in the US State Department. For what doing a great that. success story. <laughs> now, but, but the point is, is that, you know, it's, it is nitty gritty, almost petty sometimes, uh, local politics and, and within the international community that surprise you. I, I'd heard of this, I read Richard's book, uh, et cetera, and, and there, there, were, there were people actively in the United Nations who were, and had publicly stated that they're going to try to make the special court fail. Isn't that absurd? Yeah. Isn't that amazing? But that's well documented, and what you do is you go back and just, because again, remember I told you earlier, it's not about any of this. It's foreign about the victims. And you just go back, work with your people, and get the job done because it's the right thing to do. It's about justice, not about the madness sometimes of, of the pettiness of, that's all around you called dust. You just have to stay focused and get the job done. Richard Goldstone is right about the issue of resources because you can't really do anything unless you have adequate resources. So each year, we get into a, a battle over the budget with the Assembly of States parties, and I'd be remiss if I didn't mention uh, that. We're shaping up for another battle. Uh, we try to reassure states parties uh, 
the, the investment is, is worthwhile, we'll use the money wisely, but they look upon the, the increases that we uh, request, even though we justify them as, 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 as transparent as we can, uh, with alarm. And so we have to deal with this every year, and I think we're shaping up for another hard uh, battle. But there's a couple of other things I just want to mention from the perspective of the International Criminal Court. For there was a period of time when we were going, and this is before my, my time actually at the court, but uh, the, the court was going after warlords and uh, people like that uh, in African conflict situations. And it wasn't until uh, the, the uh, aim was a little bit higher with respect to uh, heads of state and others in, in very powerful positions that we began to get some real pushback from the African Union. And that has been one of the, of the great uh, difficult challenges. Uh, I think inevitably we will get, in quotes, out of Africa, although I say we will never abandon Africa because of the victims who suffer there. They are suffering uh, and they need uh, the intervention of the International Criminal Court in, in certain of the situations. So we will not abandon them, but inevitably we'll get out of Africa and people will wonder well, what was all the fuss about. But uh, that has been difficult, and we do have a strategy to engage with the African Union, to do all we can to re uh, repair the relationship with the African Union, and on an individual country uh, basis, we get very excellent support uh, from African civil societies, from governments, uh, from uh, other organizations. But uh, it's, again, the politics uh, that you're engaged in, in this kind of work that can prove uh, to be very difficult. And before I, I'm quiet on this issue, there's one other thing I have to talk about, and I'm sure uh, my colleagues here will have uh, recognized the same problem. I don't think the UN, I don't think the Assembly of States Parties, I don't think any of these uh, political and diplomatic people in setting up uh, these, these institutions realized the corruption and the intimidation and the risk that witnesses would be exposed to in dealing with these cases. And we're finding at the ICC that practically all of our cases contain an element of that. We have learned better how to deal with it in the Office of the Prosecutor, and we find now that our judges have really woken up to the risk to the integrity of their proceedings uh, that this kind of activity uh, uh, presents, and they're beginning to react it in a very uh, muscular fashion, which is really good. But it is one of the issues that we have to, to deal with. We are untouchable in terms of the, the honesty and integrity of, of the, our people, of the, of the registry people, of the judges, but they can get at us through our witnesses. That is, that is where we are vulnerable. So we have to take steps to protect our witnesses, to protect our contacts so that we don't attract attention to our witnesses, but also where necessary to prosecute people uh, for offenses against the administration of justice where necessary, or to engage states' parties to do the same. That is one of the huge challenges, and it's one of the realities in which we all live, I think. No, that's absolutely correct. I think the other courts have had, uh, have actually had the luxury of having judges who are not so resistant to uh, very early on <coughs> providing protective measures for witnesses. Uh, I think the ICC judges have been uh, more hesitant to do that and uh, have done it perhaps later than they should have. But first and foremost, uh, if people have the courage to come forward and you ask them to come forward, you have an obligation to them. Uh, and that may mean sometimes you simply don't use the witness because the risk to them is so great that, and you can't protect them, so you, you don't use them. But that's a very real feature of all of these. You know, these people are living amongst hundreds, thousands of perpetrators who haven't been brought to justice, will not be brought to justice, perhaps continue to be active supporters of the people that you are investigating. Uh, and so you talk to them, uh, you use them as witnesses, they continue to live in those communities. Uh, and these people find out who they are. They either find out through the, uh, through the accused, uh, violating protections and telling them, uh, or they sometimes themselves <laughs> make it known uh, that they're witnesses, but they're greatly at risk. And so witness protection is, is a, a huge challenge that we cannot always meet successfully. Despite all these challenges, all of you are full of hope, and you keep going back at this with a sense of determination. The last question is a quick one, and I need each of you to answer it. Who is the role model, historically, that inspires you, or someone currently 
in the field of human rights that makes you realize that you can attack these problems and follow in their footsteps. Obviously, we're here because of Jackson, but perhaps somebody current, if you could be very quick and efficient with your answer, give us a name and briefly tell us why, uh, and then unfortunately we need to end our time here. All right, if I have to pick one person, or, there are many people I've looked up to who have been... Uh, and Greg Peterson is not an answer, all right? <laughs> no, no, okay. no, if I may, uh, and I think you'll all have the same experience. There are going to be people that you look up to, that are important to you, that mentor you, that inspire you, and I've had that. I've been very lucky in my life. But if I have to pick up one person in the context that we're talking about, I would say Louise Arbour who succeeded uh, Richard Goldstone as the prosecutor for ICTY and ICTR. And she is a role model for me because she's really smart. Cuts to the heart of uh, an issue uh, very, very quickly. She has integrity, uh, fairness toward the defense, and integrity in everything she does, and courage. Courage, not afraid to go nose to nose with, with the biggest and the meanest. And so, frankly, we would have walked through fire for Louise Arbour, and she is one of my role models, one of my heroes, if you will. Thank you. Louise Arbour, how about for you? Uh, I, I want to make sure that this recording now definitely gets to my boss, because I think for, <laughs> <laughs> for me, uh, the, in the office I'm representing today, uh, my boss, Norm, for, for me and my career, was a real uh, inspiration to work with him uh, in the early years when he first came to the STL and became the prosecutor. He's, he's been a, uh, he's a real lawyer's lawyer, and, uh, and I like that about him. And, and, and his, He's an inspiring man, man to work with, and, and, and he demands a lot of his staff, and he gets results, and, and um, yeah, he's driven in his work, so. Randy, how about you? I think my perspective is a little different. The, um, and it would have to be a group of people who inspire me and give me hope and, and give me resolve uh, are the victims and survivors of these crimes and the witnesses who will come forward. Thank you, David. Uh, I was going to say Nelson Mandela, but he has to be alive. So uh, uh, another person that I admired greatly is, uh, uh, is uh, Kofi Annan, uh, would be someone who had the courage uh, to appoint me as chief prosecutor. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, Brenda stole my answer, now I'm trying to think. Which I can't be the same yeah. one. I would say, uh, you know, an example is the uh, Sergei Magitsky that you gave, that we honored the other night. Um, that's the type of person who uh, put himself at great risk in pursuing uh, what he believed was justice. It could be someone in the past as well. Sir. Oh, so, no, yeah. fair, he changed the world. <laughs> <laughs> who would it be for you, Dave? In the past? No, it actually wouldn't be Nelson Mandela, because the okay. one point is, is that, he, uh, that he said that the way we're going to move this country forward is forgiveness. And uh, wow, what a wonderful, powerful tool, and what a wonderful world it would be if we could gain. Uh, yeah, I don't think I have really a, a role model. Uh, I think it's much more the idea of justice and, and uh, accountability and being part of, of, of uh, realizing it. But if I have to name one person which really has impressed me most professionally, now that Kofi Annan is free, I can take uh, Kofi, Kofi Annan, uh, because he was the one who hired me into the UN system, and uh, all discussions, conversations I had with him, it was at the time when I was in charge of the Hariri Investigation Commission, these were really very in inspiring uh, and in-depth discussions. So he was really one of those world leaders who really impressed me. Thank you. Hassan? I admire a lot of people past and present, including some who have been mentioned here. But my, my role model remains that old man from my village, <laughs> where I'm going from here today, who always urged me to give the utmost I could do to the task at hand. To devote all my energy and all my attention to the task at hand and give it all that I had. The old man from my village. Beautiful. And that's what David said earlier in the reports of cutting, cutting wood and catching <laughs> one. That's beautiful. Richard, how about you? I think in the second half of my life, undoubtedly Nelson Mandela was already uh, uh, in, in, in my professional life when he was released from prison, but I had the, 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 the great privilege of getting to know him well, uh, working with him 
and uh, spending a lot of time on a one-on-one -on -one basis with him. And uh, he, he, he is certainly the most amazing person that, that I've ever had the privilege to, to, to meet and work with. We're lucky in South Africa. The, the close second for me would be, would be uh, Desmond Tutu, Archbishop Tutu. A man of tremendous courage. I mean, you know, I did just, just, just one anecdote about, about uh, Archbishop Tutu, who, as you know, some of you will know, he, he led our Truth and Reconciliation Commission, and we're very lucky uh, to have him do that. But during, during the transition to democracy, um, the second most popular leader in South Africa after Mandela was a man called Pisani. He was really a young, charismatic, and black South Africans worshipped Pisani. And a young Polish immigrant was, was paid to assassinate Hani. And he was assassinated one Saturday morning uh, outside his home. Uh, and fortunately, an Afrikaner woman noted, saw it, noted down the registration number of his car. And he was apprehended at a roadblock within half an hour. And uh, uh, he, he, he's, uh, he was sentenced to life in prison. And uh, at, at, at a memorial for Chris Hani, there were 100,000 people at a huge stadium in Soweto outside Johannesburg. And they were, they were angry. They were ready to, to, to go on a rampage. Mandela had calmed them down on national television two days before, but at this function, they, they were, there were a lot of anti-white statements being, being, being made, the fact that they, the assassin was a white person. And uh, Archbishop Tutu, in his indomitable style, in, in the middle of his talk, said to, to the crowd, waving, raising his arms, said, we are all God's people. It was sons, he repeated, we are all God's people. And he repeated until the whole crowd was with him, shouting, we are all God's people. And then Tutu added, black and white. And there was dead silence. On, on, on television, pe pe people couldn't believe that, that, that Tutu wouldn't be attacked. And he repeated, black and white. We are all God's people, black and white. And the crowd then took up the cry, black and white. I mean, that, that, that sent a message, that, that was an amazing message to, to South Africa, but it took huge courage and, and charisma on his part to actually get 100,000 angry people to, to, to realize that all people are equal. Well, on behalf of uh, Kate, we appreciate you being our role models and being people we can aspire to be like in, in our paths and our practices. Um, as a thank you gift for the prosecutors, I'd like at least all our students from the Summer Institute to end our session, to come up and personally introduce yourself to one prosecutor and thank them for their work and give them a handshake, all right? And if the law students would like to join them in that, I think that would be fine too. Thank you so much to everyone, and we'll look forward to talking more soon.